So welcome everyone for our practical lecture 3.1, um, basically in our cloud computing and big data course, having a very practical lecture today. Um, the topic is today building scalable machine learning pipelines with Apache Spark. And pipelines are a very important term. You heard that already in the machine learning course, I hope, at least some of you, right? It refers also to massaging the data before you even throw it at machine learning algorithms. And this is a very important part, especially for reproducibility. If you always want to have the same, let's say, modus operandi for the different machine learning um, elements you do. But before we go into the material of this lecture and see how we do this in cloud computing with Apache Spark, let's review a little bit what we had the last time. If you remember, the last time was quite dry. We looked at Apache Spark a little bit more from the theoretical perspective. What is the core of Apache Spark? which was basically a very powerful tool in terms of resiliency, in terms of scalability. You program basically a lot in Python without ever knowing on how many workers, how many actually parts of the infrastructure you use. Do you have 30 workers, 60 workers, 120 workers? So this is basically the paradigm that you have. And it's very nicely and completely different usually from one of our HPC approaches that we teach in the other course. There you relatively know, do you scale up to 2000 GPUs? Do you scale up to 3000 GPUs and so on and program that a bit more clearly. Here, it's basically a little bit hidden and that is one of the beauty of Apache Spark. So we learned that the Spark core, of course, has a second part to it that we shifted a little bit aside last time. If you remember the Hadoop distributed file system, all the data aspects will come in lecture four, lecture five, with MapReduce and so on. We cannot teach all at once in Apache Spark in this lecture. Another aspect to take away is really that Apache is basically uh, one of these big open source um, stacks, really, which we will learn also in the couple of lectures coming, but they're also deployed everywhere on all basically clouds that you will find. So in Amazon Web Services, in Google Proc, basically have it everywhere in MS Azure, obviously. And this makes it a very nice tool also for portability these days combined with Jupyter Notebooks as well. Then when you think about what brings an added value to Apache Spark, we looked the last time a little bit on the machine learning library, which is one of the interesting ones for us here in the course, working with big data, understanding scalability, far, far away from SkyKit learns and all the serial approaches. Basically also thinking about what is left and right. You see here, we had the idea of Spark SQL. We'll look into that today as well. But then also streaming, which is basically then a very interesting topic we will pick it towards the end of the course when we also think about you know having this petabyte of data I was explaining in the beginning but every 20 seconds so the question is can we store that should we store that or should we maybe filter it and using the streaming of data basically as a mechanism for it is one of the strengths of Spark as well that we basically cover more towards the end of the course not today and GraphX is, of course, a library, which means um, that basically it's a library for graph problems. And this is something which is perhaps shared with graph neural networks these days. It's also very big topics in our research projects. But there are many problems that cannot be structured like a SQL, right? There's kind of structured way, like a relational database management system. Everything is beautiful in the table. Everybody has the same fields. Everything is filled. Many of the problems we have today, like, for instance, social media networks, you know, that are absolutely unstructured, right? They so basically have connections which are not really the same way. And we looked this time, uh, we looked the last time, sorry, basically on this web kind of connections, the importance of the web connections and how you could do this with PageRank as one example of using this API. So long story short, what Apache Spark, however, is doing when you have this Python, which looks so beautiful, internally, lots of things happening, right? Which you see essentially on the lowest part here. So you have a very nice, let's say small statement here in Python, which is absolutely unparalleled and looks very beautiful one line, but internally it is converted actually in two different steps. So firstly, it's broken up into different resilient data sets. Then you have a scheduler, a kind of DAX scheduler that breaks parts of all this disruption and schedule it basically on this large infrastructure. So DAC is a directed acyclic graph because acyclic is important. When you go cyclic back, you have some problem in the recourse of nature, then it wouldn't work so much. Hence, it's mostly DAC scheduling. We also learned that yarn is a part of it, basically this kind of scheduler that then rooms and get this free on the different Spark worker nodes. And this is the, exactly the idea today 
to learn a little bit more what are executioners, how that means with scaling, how you basically can create your own HD inside cluster inside the cloud. We use MS Asia today as an example and for your first assignment, but we'll in later assignments also look in Amazon Web Services for other services, but also of course in Google Proc. Then the second part was really an application scenario that we pick today again in detail and go step by step. And then again, that you have to reiterate again as your assignment one, right, on the cloud, which was about logistic regression. It's one of the simple learning algorithm. If you remember, we had the perceptual learning algorithm, which was a linear learning model. Logistic regression basically puts a logistic function over it. Also very, very simple model, but we basically will revisit this and see it has still some computational complexity in the optimization step. And hence their scheduling it out is quite needed. But of course, by preparing the data, looking in the data, data exploration, topics that I told you in CRISP DM, this interesting reference model, if you remember this cycle, uh, how basically many of the machine learning and data mining projects work. This is always a case to look at this. And then of course, parallelization also helps you. Admittedly, it was a bit dry in lecture three. That's why we want to have here today a little bit practice. I show you a bit in MS Asia how that works. And basically you repeat that then in your assignment one. We also saw with this a little bit um, several elements which are important. One is definitely, again, the speed up that you basically get when you, for instance, compare Hadoop versus Spark. Hadoop was very popular before. Spark then came around with lots of in-memory ideas, how you leverage really, um, let's say, the memory to really um, get lots of speed up. As you know, memory is the fastest that you can get instead of dropping to disk all the time, intermediate results. You try as best as possible to keep things in memory. And by this, it outperforms Hadoop, of course, a lot. But we also learned that this is depending now on what you pay, right? So what you pay in the cloud means the more memory you want, the more you pay, right? Of course, the CPUs with high memory are very costly. So the benefit of Spark is also basically very costly. That's what I'm getting it, right? In the end, you have to decide, and we will look and do this today when we have the practice part, um, how this is really accumulating quickly because it's charged by the hour in the cloud. And that could mean for a startup quite a lot of money. At the end, uh, we had going through some source code. We will iterate about this today. Um, we basically have said, of course, the evaluation step is important at more notably the training, this iteration that you see once you hit the fit, which means the training starts of an algorithm. Basically, we had here an example of stochastic gradient descent, um, basically going downhill on the error function. This is just one example. There are different optimizers but uh, this is something we will reiterate also today. So let's see a little bit that this is a practical lecture, as I said, mostly relevant for your assignment one, but also of course catches away the idea how MS Asia works um, and so on. We have of course a very simple machine learning problem. It's binary classification, hence uh, one of the simplest uh, you can get basically in machine learning. But still I try to bring now the theory elements that we had in the couple of lectures before was lecture two, lecture three, inside that so that we have a kind of practical building blocks overview we will see as Lee how that materialized when we have this diagram and put the different building blocks of machine learning together together of course and also with the idea of having some practice um, application which we have in logistic regression uh, with this it's also important to think about the crisp model again rarely you have in practice that you have data and you throw it to machine learning there's a huge process before you basically look, inspect the data, data exploration, you prepare the data for a machine learning algorithm, you prepare it differently, you do feature selection, feature engineering. So there's a whole world which brings us into the pipeline idea that we will revisit today. For instance, doing decisions based on text is not easy for mathematical models. Hence, we have to bring it from text into numbers and that's also what we do today. So with this, we formalize basically the structure of machine learning a little bit so that it's not just data, throw some machine learning algorithm down, right? So this is the takeaway message today from this. And of course we do this with cloud computing saying in a way there are no limits in a way when we have big data, we can scale out. But of course in the cloud, you go there and pay the price, right? And this is also the learning effect today and that you have in your assignment, I hope really learning the parallelization idea which is here and there, of course, hidden. That's the beauty of Spark, making it really uh, user-friendly in the cloud. So 
when we start with MS Asia, um, basically when you go to the website here, you will see um, in the idea of the cloud, MS Asia is very known. You can search here for different things. For instance, one would be now this HD Insight. We already discussed here and there, which is basically an, a kind of cloud um, based on open source products. And you will find a lot of information around it, um, what you can do, your command line interfaces for it. So it's a big theme in this kind of cloud. And when I here log in, and I hope some of you have already started to create an account, maybe just asking if you have used the self-study time properly, good, good. So basically we need this account later on and I show you how exactly um, this is actually done. But I guess getting to Azure is very much quick, right? You basically go to Google, MS Asia, you will find it. Once inside, you will find many, many different services, which is best explained if you have here the left-hand side or all services, you easily get lost, right? So the HD Insight service is one particular one for a very specific purpose. And basically having all of these Apache products together, you will find many of these um, are usually under ideas of analytics, but as you know, with logistics, uh, regression and so on, you would almost say it's already machine learning, basically. So there's not a, let's say, tough distinction between this. But, but here and there, they have very specific products. Also in Amazon, they would have um, the SageMaker tool for AI. Although you could say, basically, you get SageMaker, you can also use this for analytics. Something which we will explain a little bit more in the course, but which describes, again, the overlaps between data analytics, data analysis, um, signal processing, machine learning, data mining. They're all very close to each other. And you have here the opportunity of this HD Insight clusters that you can have. And you see one of it is running that you basically also will use in your assignment. So, but coming back a bit to the slides, and I will hop again between the practice and the, you know, basically the slides so that you have always in the slides, also the material I talk in the cloud. Just remember what's where basically now the cloud computing steps, right? We will do this, of course, when we are not happy with our laptop. There's not enough in memory or the CPU is weak and so on. So we want to go to the cloud for big problems. If you have very small problems, then use Anaconda, download Skykit Learn or so and do it there. So here it's really thinking big for bigger problems. The first thing is to do, you have a subscription to have. In MS Asia, that means you pay perhaps like something like $24, basically per month, to get the subscription package. So the selling of the idea that pay per use and everything starts with zero is wrong. Basically, you have to have normally a support package that goes alongside. So you have already initial money you have to pay in order to get, let's say, answers to queries to use the cloud. In your case, it's not true. You have an education account, and I will invite you to the resource group. So no you know, credit card swipe for you. But uh, if you want to use the cloud as a company, you basically start directly with swiping the credit card, which is a business model. And of course, you can select between basic, simple support, platinum support and you pay more and more. Once you have the subscription, the pay per use per resources is true. So the resources are not charged yet. You have no resources. You pay zero euro, just basically the support money. So we want to do a deployment of a Spark cluster in the HD Insight and then want to do a Jupyter Notebook on a click. And that's what we want to do today in practice. And I'll show you how that works. And then of course, work with the so-called Spark session inside this Jupyter Notebook to do some data analysis, data exploration, and so on, which is of course fairly, uh, let's say, um, dynamic. It depends what you want to do in the cloud. Of course, for your assignment, I uploaded already the assignment one description in the module. So you basically have the Jupyter Notebook. You just have to import it in the Jupyter that you start on the HD inside. So let's look a little bit how that works. And of course, then the machine learning model steps are of course there. Um, the way how it works here is basically you create uh, after the subscription, you basically go to HD Insight. We let's do that here a little bit together. When we want to create the service here, um, let's make it like this. I will not completely create one because we have already one. And as you know, everything is charged. And that is the first learning experience. Even if no one uses the HD Insight cluster, you pay for it, right? Because you already have no resources that are specifically deployed for Spark and running 24 seven in the cloud for you to do the assignment. In that sense, we have already running costs and running bills. And this is a very good takeaway message, particularly for startups, right? That already, you know, have to pay just when this kind of cluster is running. 
you see also from the analytics perspective and from these open source stacks that HD Insight offers, you have lots of options. Um, we said the Hadoop stack would be one. We will learn this a little bit in lecture four and five, Hadoop and so on, and pick what all these different, let's say, Hadoop aligned services are. We focus in the beginning on Spark so that you can do early your assignment one, right? So then we go and extend the whole ecosystem of Apache. Then Kafka is very um, actually often used HBase for databases. Um, there are lots of different ideas. Storm is actually into streaming, also very strong service we will have on the later part of the course. And of course, there's still some R dependencies um, where basically you have a strong language, which is often used. In our case, we select Spark here and then have some interesting passwords to pick, um, which you basically now here have very open on the web, which you in real setup should never do, but this is a teaching setup, so it doesn't matter. Basically, we pick here some interesting passwords and users and then go to the storage. The storage is very tricky in MS Azure. You have to have created this before, right? This was one of the errors we run to all the time. Um, essentially, you have to create a cloud computing and big data storage as we did here for the course or any other type of storage first before you do the HD Insight and have to reuse it. Otherwise, um, you get some errors. And the idea is that the data stays persistent, right? Well, once you kill the HD Insight cluster, you probably want to take care that the data is still there, right? HD Insight, again, is for processing the data, et cetera. Data storage is somewhere else. Also something we will allude to in you know, lecture four and five and so on. This Hadoop distributed file system and other storages we will learn here with bucket stores and so on. Security networking, we also leave out for a while. It's already basically very close here. No one can really access it. Um, more important for the course is now the configuration and pricing and why I have basically had to stop the lecture on Tuesday because we just not had enough resources. And every time you want to ask you know, for a quota increase, it takes a day because in US doing your you know, quota increase, I'll show you in a minute, in order to get the right, let's say, amount of cluster resources. So very poor service in my mind. So you swipe the credit card and still you cannot really get a cluster, right? So you have to always back to get more quota. I'll show you in a minute. Why is that needed? Because you essentially see here, you can now pick and create your service. As we had the last time, you remember hopefully a little bit, there was this head node, right? Which runs all the magic of Spark. And there were these worker nodes, which do the real job, right? Where basically we can scale up very much. And the zookeeper is something which will come also in subsequent lectures, take it a little bit as a management helper tool in the moment to keep track of the, basically the Spark cluster. But what you see immediately is you need two of these head nodes just for redundancy if one will fail, basically the other can take over. Otherwise the whole management of the cluster is gone and you start with zero or everything is lost you have done before. And you see a little bit the type of resources now you can do. And when you look at the prices, um, you immediately see the correlation with gigabytes in memory, right? If you remember, Spark leverages memory, but of course, memory is a very, very expensive resource. So you see, when we would pick here now for the head, basically, and say, well, we are not enough with 64 gigabytes, we want to have 112 gigabytes, make it faster, 16 cores, we immediately create a higher price. Ignore a little bit the message now that you see here, which is again our limits. We always have to back to increase. But uh, this is the point now where you see that costs. And this is just the managed, uh, the management part of the cluster. Now, what I said to you also from the worker node perspective, if you want to really speed up machine learning, the point is you here want to have also high level of you know, gigabytes per RAM because then you really benefit. Right? And you see suddenly we increase from three out three euros per hour to seven euros per hour. And you know, basically, if you want to really scale out now, as we discussed with 30 worker nodes or 60 worker nodes in the production setting, we can see what that means. You would hear 30, right? Now we basically have 40 euros per hour. And as I said, it's used or not used, doesn't play a role. The cluster is running for you, for your company, it's already used resources. Right, so this is something, of course, when you are in a company, you have to think about. Is it really worse? Um, of course, you can scale up and scale down. That's a beauty in it. So you can always, you know, reduce it. That's one of the idea of the clouds, if you remember, right? This elasticity. You see, maybe around Christmas, you have lots of workload. 
maybe over the summer there's rare workload so you reduce the number of workers you add to the number of workers but that's why i said there's a high correlation with memory per performance but there's also a high correlation between basically the money that you have to invest when you want to have a powerful spark engine right so here what we would have would be a very powerful spark engine we have 60 workers that you know are now ready to crunch our problem in 60 parallel bits so to speak but you see we go here there and pay the price for it and this is something which is now the key in all of these cloud scenarios because there are lots of different options what you can do with the course you see that's only scratching the surface um, there are lots of different options what you do but if you want to have really ones that perform very well you have to have high memory nothing prevents you and of course for our teaching setup we have to reduce a little bit the price because you know Luna from the engineering he has to pay for me this from the teaching budget and he will say more is bad bad and this is one of the next critics um, education put the HD insight out right out of the education part and MS Azure and this is really really nasty um, there are lots of threats in the internet that this is not good practice and two years ago, we could do it that you all create a HD Insight service and, you know, create your clusters and learn it. But yeah, over COVID, they secretly removed that from their portfolio. So we have to provide one for you. Uh, one idea is also that Bitcoin miners got the idea and lots of Bitcoin students suddenly came and want to have the 100 US dollar. You still get that, the 100 US dollar credits. You're just not allowed to create a HD Insight service to compute a lot, for instance, Bitmining. So I think that's one of the ideas behind it. But of course, the whole functionality of the cloud works, right? It's just an educational um, problem we have in basically as professors, but we found a way around it to at least let you, let's say, experience a cluster. And that's really the one I wanted to leave you on the table. You see directly, um, depending on the resources, the money, et cetera, I will not create here one because I have already created one. You can imagine when I say review and create, it will start up deploying the service and so on you will see that I put that a little bit in the slides as well and here's the thing I wanted to say with a subscription that this needs to be before um, you have to pay as you go which maybe costs basically with the normal support around 24 bucks I think we roughly pay plus then of course the amount of resources and here you see why we had to drop the lecture on Tuesday because um, we thought when we swipe the credit card, we would get access to resources, but you see the quota is zero in everything. Also very weird, um, at least my PhD student and me, we thought about this because when you swipe the credit card, you're ready to pay and you should be able to use it, but you couldn't because everything has zero quota. So you have to back at MS Azure, please, please increase our quota. Could be a protection mechanism, of course. You know, you can imagine if you have now 100 and someone unused, unused this, you know, or unwisely used that 24 7 every day and don't think about it, your credit card gets quickly, you know, with 80 euros per hour charged. So, in this sense, it's maybe a bit of protection mechanism, but also from my neutral university professor perspective, uh, a very bad service quality. But yeah, I mean, there's room for improvement. And I have to say, at least even with a basic support, they were increasing that over a day. So we were asking, you know, basically, can you increase our course to eight? Can you increase our course to 16 for HD Insight? And the next day we got it. As admittedly, they didn't drop our request, but uh, it was really, really slow. And that's a bit weird in my comparison when I compared with Amazon, when I compared with Google Clouds. Anyway, the stability of the service, the user interface for it, the flexibility of the services are very good. So changing different cluster types there, I can't complain. It's really good. You see the price estimate I like especially as well, that you can very quickly get an estimate how expensive your Spark cluster would be, you know, just by drag and drop. Switching a gigabytes, you know, between 64 and 128 gigabytes already, we saw the cost. That helps a lot and not everybody is doing it and basically creating the cluster took around 20 minutes 30 minutes to start up to deploy which is i think also fair depending of course on the number of you know threats you have then the user interface in my opinion is also very friendly if you now basically look on this uh, let's go back and practice a little bit what the cloud is about so we skip here the creation process because we have already one and in your assignment, I mean, the idea is to learn a little bit the environment, you know, click around the dashboard, see a little bit what you can do there, 
what different services are in the categories. I think some of you already started there and you will see there are many different services. The quotas is what I had here on the, um, on the slides. And in fact, in preparation of our assignment, I asked for more, of course, let's see, maybe they have satisfied my request. I think I asked for 50 now. So let's hope that that would work. That takes a bit of time. Okay, let's wait for this a little bit while we plunge ahead with the idea of now using it. So we will use Jupyter Notebook um, by click. I'll show you in a minute when this is basically coming. And of course there, um, basically when you have the HD Insight cluster here, uh, you have again the setup nicely seen so that you see how much you can actually do with this and how much power you really have underneath. So for our really application in the assignment one, we have this food inspection. We have really touched on that a little bit already here and there. Um, again, the idea is that quality evaluations in the kitchen and some restaurants, you know, by strings saying over time, there is a pattern, right? If this is rusty, old, smells, bad, old kitchen, whatever, all of these terms somehow give us a pattern. Well, they will probably fail the food inspection while others maybe say everything is clean, smells fresh, et cetera, all of these basically will pass the food inspection. However, we can imagine there's no exact mathematical formula for that, right? So there's no one that can give you just a concrete physical formula that this is true. And then we know there's some data existing in our case, as we said this before, that's from an open repository that we can just use. And luckily for us, it's even already preloaded in the cloud. That's why I also use this uh, basically a little bit. So basically this is there. And what we want to do now is basically do a machine learning out of it. We want to not memorize all of these violations and say, well, that's something then that we can memorize and basically then think about and look to another one and see, well, is that really uh, you know, also violating or will it pass or fail? Here we want to have a system created, a machine learning system that really learns from the data and not just memorizes like a database, which is a big distinction why we do machine learning. The rest of the parts were already clear and I try in this lecture to put an emphasis a bit more on the learning here. Hence, we do some formalization also along the way, how machine learning works alongside this practical things we do. So normally you would start really with a, basically the idea that this pattern needs to be a function in some way mathematically. We call that the unknown uh, target function, which is the ideal function that perhaps would create the data, but which will never exist and we never will know. So it's a theoretical assumption basically that we have and that we put in our learning diagram, right? So in training examples as a second part, we said we need to have, right? So this is also very clear. So this is another, let's say, part in our diagram where we know in our supervised scenario, at least we have training examples with specific features that gives you the vector X here. And all of those, because it's supervised, have a specific Y alongside which is a class, in our case, plus one, minus one, fail or pass food inspection. So let's put that in a practical machine learning overview that you already maybe then can relate to over and over again when you have other assignments, other work in other courses and so on. So in this sense here, machine learning starts, as I was saying earlier, it's learning from data. So let's do it and practice a little bit and let's see how the cloud reacts a little bit. For some reason, the quota is not coming back here, but it's not really of our big interest. Could be that the connection is not too good, but it should be working with the cluster and the Jupyter notebook. At least I tested that and Shadi tested this morning as well, my PhD or one of my PhD students, and it was working as well. So I'm quite confident that just should work too. You see here the cluster that we created in a specific resource group that we will share with you in the class so that everybody of you has access to this cluster. And once you have access to this cluster, you see the same overview. And when you basically start the Jupyter Notebook, you will come to this interesting question of username and password that we configured basically, and I will share that with you in Ed that you can basically use to sign in and come to this Jupyter Notebook that you already know a little bit from the Anaconda, right, idea or the Jupyter JC we had in lecture one and lecture two stepwise. So now you see also we are in this cluster, right, from the URI perspective, we are not any more local on Anaconda or something like this um, in the environment of our laptop. We are now again remote 
not in Jupiter JC, but really in MS Azure and can do a lot of things. So let's open assignment one. For you, of course, it will be blank. There will be nothing that you see. Um, and there's the opportunity to upload, right? Mm -hmm. So basically then just should upload the one that you have in the module. On the assignment one, you have the Jupyter notebook already there uploaded. When you go to assignment one and open this, you see this different setup that we had already in the course. Um, when you've done some exercises here, it helps you in there to say maybe restart and clear output. That's quite interesting because then you don't have the outputs of all the Spark sessions um, already in, and it would look pretty blank for you. You see here also in the first part, um, the PySpark API we use basically now in uh, Python for the Spark ML library, which means we include the pipelines, things we will talk about in the second course hours. And then the logistic regression as a machine learning algorithm and some data preparation ideas, how we can come from text into basically more mathematical representation that is used in machine learning. You see also the SQL support structured query language, which we use a little bit later for evaluations. So you essentially have to start this. And what's happening is in between now, a, a PySpark session is created. That's always your first step, right? Where you start from. And then basically, if this PySpark session is created, you can do machine learning. You can even do the graph that we discussed. And the interesting thing is now it will analyze with Yarn how many executors are there. Executors are these threads which are running on the worker nodes, right? You have 30, you have 60. Here in the course, we have three, right? As I said, teaching budget. It's not overwhelming much, but we can use it in parallel at least. But in practice, you would have maybe 30, 60. There are no limits depending on the price and urgency of the computing. So this usually takes a little bit of time. Um, and basically, then we have also time for a question. Um, is it three workers for all of us or three workers for each? No, it's three workers for all of you. You basically share that. So my assumption is, as I said, firstly, I try to increase a quota. So I already asked for more. Um, the second point is my assumption is that basically uh, not all of you will use assignment 24-7 and run the Jupyter Notebook all at the same time. But that's three for everyone right now. Um, there would be basically no Spark course available. There will be a message when you do exactly what I do right now. You will basically get a message there, no Spark part course, and you have to come basically in 10 minutes when the other team's stopping or so. But yeah, from practice and experience, usually the teams have different times of working and so on. So um, in this sense, I see it not in the moment as a problem, but we also increase the number of resources. So that should be working. Again, of course, the idea of the initial deadline, if you remember, was that not everybody starts on the day before the deadline. <laughs> so avoid exactly that, that you know, in the last 24 hours, everybody is using this kind of spark uh, parts. Good. So as I said, usually that takes a little bit of time. So let's move a little bit maybe then further in the in the kind of uh, in the slides that I have to it. But you will see in practice it also works. You have now a Spark session available. You have the Yarn application ID, which means now you are scheduled. You are occupying these three worker nodes. And of course, they're still idle. They don't do anything, but they're scheduled your session. And now with this, the executors are basically available. And it's basically your first start when you do anything in terms of Spark in the cloud, when you do um, basically this Jupyter Notebooks. Then of course, one of the next steps would be to think about the data. As I said here, the food inspection data that we have, we don't know much about it yet. We will look into this. It's basically here already in the cloud. So you have a HDI samples uh, data sets, which in food inspection gives you already a training set in number one, food inspection one and a test set for food inspections too, which we will look then in the second part of the course today, right? So in this, let's see if the cloud comes back to us here. Okay, so you see that worked, it takes a bit of time. Um, and now you basically have this job scheduled. We will look now to get the data from the samples. Um, this usually should be getting quicker. And basically we can also do and run our first idea of a parallel job by inspections. Inspections means basically this is now the text file that has been read in. It's a data frame. That's nice. But now we basically took a job and take one. In other words, we want to look into the data. As I said to you, usually machine learning starts with data exploration, 
data understanding. We have no idea what how the violations look like. So the first step is look what the data is there. You see the running, basically you see here the spark. It's one job in the IDO spark and you have the three executors um, that actually do some things. Here is how the data looks like, um, admittedly a little bit, um, not really visibility, but you see here the ID, you see the num, the name of a restaurant, or here is a daycare. And then lots of violations when you look a little bit here. Shields are missing on the hood of cooking equipment. So lots of violations, which suggests for our pattern, well, it maybe will fail. Of course, there's also the, the one that is basically then saying it will pass or fail. So this brings us to the next idea here. So to the slide, maybe to have it alongside, we look a little bit what are the features now that are of interest to us? Maybe the ID, the name, the results, will it pass or fail? Violations, which are text, and then I look from this. So basically, we are here in the business understanding slash data understanding world still. Now, when we continue, um, we want to basically now do feature selection, as I discussed. We just want to have the name, the re results, and the violations. So that's what we call feature selection. From all of the data I have here, I go now and pick some basically out of this. You see here, we use the violations, uh, the inspections data, and we map it to a new data frame that we created essentially here with these couple of fields with the different indexes of the different you know, data we had in the beginning. According to the schema, we get basically a, a nice temporary table with we basically can now use for further computing. So let's see, you see here that's already done. And of course, we want to look at this, right? So how does it now look like? Obviously, we don't have everything anymore, but the important boot violations uh, we have still there, which is, of course, important for us. Everything I sort of show is, of course, also now in the slides. So I maybe don't do the one-to-one -one every time, also for the sake of the time. But you see results, fail, pass is important for us, which violations, um, the ID, and the name of the restaurant. You also seen this was executed again with three executors. And here we just want to have an overview of the data, say how many distinct results are there, which is of course now interesting for us thinking about the machine learning idea. We set a binary classification problem. Results pass and fail. So now we have to check, is that really true, right? Is it really a binary classification problem? This is something what we still have to do in data understanding. Do we have the data being ready for it, for having a binary classification problem? And when you look at this, it suggests like fail and pass, pretty obvious, should be a binary classification problem. But sometimes there are also surprises when you look in this and we will have a look in this. That's why I say it's important to do the data understanding. Just for the mathematical building blocks, now what we think about now, what is now the idea of the algorithm we want to use? And the logistic regression was the one we wanted to use. So we pick it from our hypothesis set. We could use a support vector machine. We could use a neural network, but here today we use logistic regression, a linear learning model as our hypothesis set. Right? And hopefully we can train it enough to get the final hypothesis G after some time. So that's another part of the idea of the learning, um, let's say structural learning overview. So you get basically with, with this learning, hopefully to something which approximates something like the F our function almost well, although we never know, we will never know the function. If we would have the function, we just implement it and we're done. But this is a basic assumption in basically machine learning that we have to uh, adhere to. And here you see how that fits now in the practical machine learning overview. So you have a hypothesis set, you pick your model, you have a final hypothesis that you want to achieve. Of course, obviously here's something missing, right? So what brings us together now with the training examples and the logistic regression we have to look at. And this brings us to the learning algorithm, right? So just an example for a linear perceptron model example, you remember this was one hypothesis, logistic regression is another one. And this is something we basically will also look into the second part then when we come to the next session. Just that you see here, um, there are some surprises which we want to look at in the second part to give you an appetizer. There's something dubious in the results. As you see right now, I hope there are five different classes. But I cannot do a binary classification of this, right? Because the label data says five classes, but we need pass or fail. Hence, we have to do a data massaging for our problem, subsampling, et cetera, in order to get this right. But uh, I think you deserve a break 
from all this MS Azure, and we wait here for 10 minutes and come back to the second part then when we carry on with this part. Thank you. 